So I am Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and today we're going to be talking about ultrasound, specifically of the peritoneum. Two major questions to think about when we're focused on ultrasound of the peritoneum is, uh, is there free fluid in the abdomen? Um, and we'll get to the other questions as we move along. So here's a cross-section of the abdomen, courtesy of the Visible Human Project. This gives us a bit of a demonstration of the anatomy, but especially the uh, gravity-dependent areas through the abdomen, which is where we're going to find fluid accumulate. So the goal of ultrasonography in this setting is to look in the abdomen for gravity-dependent areas, which is going to be our highest yield spot for looking for fluid. So here we can see that in the right lower quadrant, which is on the left of your screen, uh, Morrison's pouch exists where the peritoneum reflects in between the kidney and the liver. So this red area would be the first spot where fluid would accumulate. On the left side, it doesn't exactly work the same. The peritoneal reflection extending behind the spleen means that the spleen can actually accumulate fluid in front or behind it. So this is going to come out as we talk about insinating the left upper quadrant and the right upper quadrant and uh, where we see fluid accumulating. So looking in the right upper quadrant at Morrison's pouch, uh, we want to focus now on this coronal view. This is more of the section that we're going to be scanning through. We're going to hold the probe with the probe marker facing up towards the patient's head, using the liver as a window to scan in what is essentially a coronal or a sagittal plane um, up towards the patient's head. And we should see the liver and the kidney as we do here um, you, when you hold the probe on the patient's right upper quadrant. So typically people, again, use the liver as a window. They're going to use the costal margin as the place where you first place the probe, typically somewhere around the anterior axillary line. Um, you do have a lot of leeway, as we'll see as you scan through the patient, anywhere from the anterior to the posterior axillary line uh, along the right side can give you the best window. So when you've done it properly, the view should look something like this, where we see in the near field here, uh, liver. That's going to extend posteriorly until we see this bright white line of the diaphragm. We see another bright white line just behind the liver, which is uh, the Morrison's pouch and the peritoneal reflection between the peritoneum and gerotus fascia surrounding the kidney. And this line should extend around, highlighting the kidney anteriorly. So we see the kidney here liver anterior to it, and this space right in here, which is really just a potential space at this point of Morrison's pouch, will be the area that we want to focus on. Here we can see in a positive image the difference between uh, the blackness of Morrison's pouch versus the white in the previous image. Black means that there's fluid that's collected here in Morrison's pouch. In this particular uh, patient's case, this could either represent uh, blue, blood in the abdomen or ascites or some other fluid that's ruptured into the abdomen. We can also, while we're in uh, this right upper quadrant view, uh, take a look a little bit higher, looking above the diaphragm. So on the left-hand side here, we see the liver here, and we see the diaphragm here. And looking above the diaphragm, we see a mirror image artifact. So this is reflection of liver tissue extending into the thorax. So this isn't actually liver tissue in the thorax above the diaphragm, but it represents just a reflection. This mirror image artifact is normal, and it's what you'd expect to see um, in most patients. When we lose that mirror image artifact, it's actually a sign of either hemothorax or pleural effusion uh, or some other fluid collection in the thorax. So here in the right side of your screen, we see liver, we see kidney, and above the diaphragm, loss of mirror image artifact, blackness representing fluid. Here again, we can see fluid in the right upper quadrant. This is really in the right thorax above the liver and diaphragm towards the patient's head, towards the side of the probe marker, we see black fluid and gray lung tissue within. And that gray lung tissue is partly because the lung is more visible because it's surrounded by fluid, and partly because the lung is now more dense than it otherwise would be because a lot of the air has been squeezed out of it uh, due atelectasis because of the surrounding fluid. So moving on to the left upper quadrant, uh, we're going to go back to this coronal slice through the human anatomy to see where we would actually place the probe. It's going to be in a coronal or sagittal uh, section oriented up towards the patient's head, and we're going to use the uh, spleen as a window looking into the area all around the spleen. So um, the probe should be held in a sagittal orientation with the probe marker towards the patient's head. You might even hold the probe a bit obliquely where the probe marker is actually a bit towards the back of the bed, um, getting an angle of your ultrasound beam that's going to be more parallel to the rib spaces. So we're going to use the spleen as a window. And in this particular view, you notice the operator's knuckles are really scraping the edge of the bed, uh, scraping the bed. 
So it's very posterior. So in comparison to the right side, the left side is going to be a higher hand position closer to the patient's head and a more posterior hand position towards the back of the patient. And here we see the spleen on the left hand side of the screen towards the patient's head, towards the probe marker. And on the right side of the screen, we see the kidney. So the interface between the spleen and the kidney isn't as important as the interface between the liver and the kidney because, again, Morrison's pouch doesn't really exist on the left side. There isn't the same equivalent um, an anatomic orientation. Instead, we really need to look all around the spleen because sometimes you'll see fluid in between the spleen and the kidney. Sometimes you'll see it in between the spleen and the diaphragm, which is this bright white structure towards the patient's head. So insinating all around the patient's spleen on the left-hand side is really important. And here we can see a somewhat subtle picture, but one that shouldn't be missed, of dark fluid just surrounding the spleen, more uh, pronounced sort of posteriorly here um, and behind the spleen and towards the superior pole of the kidney. There are a lot of areas between the spleen and the kidney here that actually look pretty normal. So again, just getting an image where you can see the spleen and the kidney touching each other does not exclude fluid in the left upper quadrant unless you're really scanning back and forth through the entire view of the spleen. So here's an example of a patient who has both fluid around the spleen as well as above the spleen. There's the diaphragm, this bright white line and uh, extending vertically in the screen. And then above the diaphragm, we see fluid up in the thorax as well. So this patient has uh, peritoneal fluid evidenced by black uh, highlighting around the spleen as well as pleural fluid around above the uh, diaphragm. And there's another example of a normal splenic uh, evaluation here, normal kidney, diaphragm, and then fluid above the diaphragm into the thorax. So we've looked in the right upper quadrant. We've looked in the left upper quadrant. We've extended both views, the right and left upper quadrant, up into the thorax to evaluate for fluid in the thorax as well. So the last area we're going to look at as part of the FAST exam evaluating the peritoneum is looking in the pelvis. So we want to have a look in the pelvic cul-de-sac, which is the area behind and inferior to the bladder. And in um, this sort of sagittal cross-section here, we can see that uh, in this male cadaver specimen, we've got the pubic bone down here, the pubic symphysis. We have the bladder just behind it. And remember that the bladder, when it's not fully full is going to be a pelvic structure. So being able to find a relatively empty bladder, you're going to find it right behind the pubic symphysis. So inferior to the bladder here, again in this male, we see prostate. And then below that and behind it, we see sigmoid colon. So where we'd like to look in the most dependent area of the pelvis is going to be right around the prostate, behind that and behind the bladder. And in order to do that, there's two views that you should look at. Transverse view to get a sense of where left and right are, to get a sense of where the bladder is in the midline. And once you've found the bladder in the midline, it's very helpful to look at a sagittal view. With this sagittal orientation of the probe, with the probe marker facing towards the patient's head, you can see um, a nice um, sagittal view of the bladder and the area behind the bladder getting into the uh, pubic bone. So, Start off with a, um, we'll start describing the sagittal view here. We're going to be using ideally the bladder as a window, and we're going to aim just above the pubic symphysis. So a lot of people go up too high towards the umbilicus, and that really limits the view significantly, especially when the bladder isn't very full. So putting the probe really right on top of the patient's pubic symphysis and then angling down should be able to help you image the uh, pelvic cul-de-sac, even in a person whose bladder is relatively empty. And then we're going to fan the probe towards the left and towards the right, looking for fluid, again, in the dependent areas behind the uterus, behind the prostate. So in this female pelvis, we can see a very large bladder here, creating a nice acoustic window for the uterus. And then behind the uterus, right about here, is where we'd want to look to see fluid. And in this particular case, there is none. Okay, so in contrast to that previous normal study of the pelvis, let's have a look at this very similar anatomy. So we have, again, a large bladder in the near field. Just behind that, we see the uterus well described with a endometrial stripe visible as well. Behind the uterus in the pelvic cul-de-sac, or, or in the case of a female, we call this the pouch of Douglas, we can see that there's a small amount of free fluid. 
So this is a positive exam of the peritoneum. Uh, if this was a fast exam or a trauma setting, it would be a positive fast exam. Now, what you would do about that amount of fluid is entirely dependent on the patient's clinical scenario. This particular image could be generated from a woman that had some mild pelvic pain, wasn't pregnant, and had a trace amount of fluid found incidentally on a pelvic ultrasound, and it wouldn't be of any clinical concern. Um, in this particular image, though, was taken from a patient who was a 23-year-old woman, uh, young, healthy, no medical problems, had excruciating abdominal pain, uh, passed out on arrival to the emergency department, had a blood pressure in the 60s, systolic, was tachycardic and uh, diaphoretic, and immediately upon uh, discovering that her pregnancy test was positive, and she had that this view in her uh, pelvis was actually taken by um, the obstetrics and gynecology service to the operating room for emergent laparoscopy, and a ruptured ectopic pregnancy was found in her fallopian tube and managed appropriately. So again, the clinical environment uh, dictates entirely how to deal with positive images, but it's important that you can recognize the ones that are subtle. So here is uh, just another example, a left upper quadrant view of a patient with um, uh, peritoneal signs, excruciating abdominal pain, and uh, we really can see nicely that there's black fluid surrounding the spleen. And one thing to keep in mind, in some of the, some of the slices through the spleen, it looks um, worse than others. Um, sometimes the only scine that you're really going to get that there's a very faint amount of fluid around an organ is it's going to seem to have almost like a black magic marker, a Sharpie pen drawn around it. So um, looking through uh, this view, we can see that sometimes the spleen is blatantly positive and sometimes it just seems like we're really seeing it very well. And sometimes when you get a really good view of an organ, it's worth double checking that there's not fluid surrounding it. Since fluid is such a good acoustic window, if you're used to getting only mediocre images of a particular piece of anatomy, and the spleen can often be a bit tricky, uh, if you're getting gorgeous uh, textbook worthy images of the spleen and it seems like it's really crisp and sharp in its outline, you should just double check that it's not because there's some fluid surrounding it. So um, this same patient, uh, we have a look in their pelvis, and this is a sagittal view of the pelvis. There's a little hint here of um, the fundus of the uterus, and then we can see this black fluid. It's got some debris floating in it, and, um, and there's also a very irregular margin around the shape of this uh, free fluid. So the only fluid in the abdomen should really be surrounded by some cystic structure, like the bladder or the gallbladder, for example. So whenever we see fluid with uh, little spiky edges, like we can see down here and up here, or fluid that's moving as the, as the patient moves or changes with your probe pressure, that's a significant sign that there, uh, there's some free fluid there. This fluid also has a bit of debris within it and some irregularity to it, some hyperechoic areas. And this can happen with many different types of fluid. It can happen with uh, debris and fibrinous material inside of ascites. It can happen when there's SBP affecting the ascites. It can happen with blood and some clots starting to form in, the, in that blood. Um, and uh, and so the, the appearance of the fluid itself, you can't necessarily tell exactly what type of fluid it is. So all fluid is going to appear anechoic or even black on ultrasound. So it's difficult just by looking at it to assess whether something is ascites, blood, urine, for example. So again, it needs to be placed in the proper clinical context. And sometimes you won't see a bladder, uh, especially in a trauma patient or a patient who's had a Foley catheter um, uh, placed in them. And sometimes it's because the bladder is empty. Sometimes it's because it's been emptied by a Foley catheter placement. Sometimes it's because it's been ruptured. So using the bladder as a landmark can often be helpful, but it's also important in the setting of seeing fluid in the abdomen uh, surrounding loops of bowel, like you can see here, to realize that just because you don't see the bladder doesn't mean you can't read a positive uh, exam of the peritoneum as well. So uh, this talk, again, covered assessment of the peritoneum, uh, which is a lot of overlap with the FAST exam, but we've discussed uh, assessing the cardiac exam, including looking for pericardial effusion in a different talk. So this essentially just covered the peritoneum itself. There's more tips and tricks and tutorials um, and uh, the possibility for getting in contact with us here in the ultrasound division. Um, email us your, your questions or comments at uh, sinaiem.us.